Um, I think when we were talking about in the beginning, you said we could like almost compare things like that type of thing. I mean, really what we've been working on the last, you know, while when we've been talking about in class about people's topics would be like how to get specific, you know, you really can't take two big topics or compare and contrast two big things in that part that's only got a couple pages to it, you know, so I'd rather you find something out that's more specific. People are doing local CSAs. People are doing veganism in college students. People, I mean, we've really generated, I think, a pretty good list. Go back through the Social 100, maybe class meetings. The last one at the beginning, or even my other class. Both, both classes, I think, have generated some really good uh, ideas for topics and stuff like that. Um, I just list a bunch of stuff there that, that tries to throw out a bunch of ideas. But they're all big. Obesity, way too big. Fast food culture, way too much. How about what is the school, C, what is CSU doing about composting? Or how could you start a composting program at Hooter School District? Um, and then call and make some contact with maybe a school or something like that. Um, yeah, so as specific as you can get, you know? I mean, examine the meatless meat burger. How come vegans want to go eat something that tastes like dead burning flesh? <laughs> I don't know. Because it smells delicious, but anyway, yeah, so try and pick something up. Hold on. Oh, my gosh, dog. Yeah. Get up. Get up. Get up. Sorry. <laughs> it's Dogville. Um, what about type 2 diabetes and the increased consumption of refined carbohydrates? Way too big. Way too big. People wrote books on that. They have – it's not that it's a bad idea. It's just too – it's too giant, enormous. You know, we've got to keep it. Um, can we talk about advertising and eating disorders? Again, that's huge, right? So you pick, pick something. You know, eating disorders, too huge. Um, you can talk about eating disorders, like maybe uh, things that are like advertised towards a certain gender to elicit a certain response. I mean, it's got to be really, you know, really much more specific. Um, I analyzed uh, why my cultural phenomenon is happening from a, I mean, that's kind of vague. I'm not sure, Audrey, what cultural phenomenon, but is happening from a sociological perspective. What about obesity problem in specific areas compared to another specific area? Too much. Skip obesity. That's, a, that's like the fallback. We have read exactly 10,000 papers on obesity. Not interested. Um, that being said, people who don't attend this class meeting will start to write a paper on obesity. <laughs> And, and later find out that it's a topic that it's, and it's just really because it's so huge. Grocery stores influencing the foods that we buy. Yes. Yeah. Like how music, like, like pick something specific. Cause again, every grocery store you step foot into is trying to influence you to buy something. Every store you step foot in. Right. So, so maybe looking at it like that, submitted a paper, that topic was too wide. Can I rewrite it? Yeah. I mean, if you've already submitted a paper, you can go back and, and do that. And we're going to grade the most recent one. I hate for somebody to rewrite something totally, but okay. Appeal of agave nectar is a replacement for sugar. There we go. Specific, you know, interesting. I don't know. It, 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 you know, can I talk about layout of stores, how a dairy is normally placed in the back. So you walk past the, sure. As long as you don't talk about how a store is laid out. Meat department could be five, 10, 20 pages. Dairy stuff could, same way, right? We gotta, gotta get it specific. And if you're gonna do a topic that you think is too big, go in and talk to somebody in person. Go in and talk to the dairy rep or the person who's head of dairy at Vitamin Cottage or Whole Foods or like, you know what I'm saying? Like actually try and, you know, I don't know, get a little bit deeper. Paper on how economics of certain seasonal foods affect what we eat. Maybe it sounds big. Um, if you can get if you can get that down, pared down a little bit, that'd be good. All right. So, not trying to come out of the gate today uh, in a way that's like you know, this is those are all too big. But whatever topic you find, I encourage you to make it as specific as possible, and just understand that writing about celiacs is huge. Maybe interviewing a few people about celiacs and how that's changed their approach and why they eat certain, I don't know. You know what I mean? It's got, again, it's got to be, got to be something that we can sink your teeth into or whatever in just a couple pages. Intermittent fasting, not necessarily. I mean, intermittent fasting might not be too broad. Hold on. It's another dog at the door. Imagine that. 
Good. Sorry. Um, so income in relation to the food you eat. Socioeconomic class in relation to food. Sure, get specific. In a city, what city? A food desert. What's a food desert mean? You know, like, because if you're talking about income and what you eat, that's still a giant top. So I'm fine with that. If you can get more specific, you know, more specific about it. Talk to some people about food choices. How are your food choices constrained by how much money you make? Um, I don't know, things like that. All right, uh, so go ahead now. And uh, yeah, I, I did, I gave, I gave many specific examples. <laughs> so um, it's just, there's so, there's so many and we've already, we've already done this. So a specific example, a CSA, all right, community shared agriculture in town. Happy Hearts Farm. Why did they decide to grow food? What impact did they make? They're on Elizabeth Street, you know? Um, yeah, you know, you're all right. Like, like, honestly, like, veganism amongst college students. Weight gain amongst people who lift weights. Uh, again, you see how all these are, are much more specific than, like, the thought of obesity, you know, or examining socioeconomic status in, in relation to food. So anyway, all right, um, answer this. Just want to confirm the date. Yes, it's due the 6th. And you can always go to any assignment and see the date underneath it. Click on assignments and it'll say due date. So no matter what announcement has ever been made, you'll know that that due date is the thing that's printed there, usually in green. Um, and that's, that's really easy to figure out. Um, so, all right. Um, okay, so tomorrow election. Uh, if you've already voted, raise your hand or thumbs up. All right. If you've not and you're going to vote tomorrow, raise your hand or thumbs up. All right. Good. And if you're not voting, um, if, if this isn't where you usually vote countrywide, or if this isn't, uh, if you had an absentee thing or you can't get back home. Anyway, congratulations, everyone who voted. Um, I've read a lot of stuff about, you know, this is is there going to be violence and is there going to da, 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 da. you know every election is a unique set of circumstances and i think um i've never seen an election before where there's been so much like this is going to go wrong this is going to go wrong this is going to go wrong. and it's almost you know constructed ahead of time um to to make people feel anxious but don't go cast your vote you can find out if your vote got counted um yeah and i think that already the numbers are tremendous like tremendous uh, i hate that word uh, the numbers are fantastic in as far as so many more people voting now than voted four years ago already. So there's a lot of important things up um, for Colorado for voting. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, national things. And, and of course, uh, you know, this, this election is going to be a big deal. I've already voted as well. Um, so my work here is done. <laughs> I'm going to wash my hands of it for a couple days um, and then uh, fly out on Thursday to uh, spend some time with my dad and help him with a lot of stuff that's going on there. Probably have to drive a truck back across Nebraska, which was looking like 60, 65 degrees for a whole week. And now suddenly the day I'm driving back, it's supposed to be four inches of snow. Yeah, it's awesome. That's why I don't go to Nebraska. <laughs> that's why I hardly ever even drive back home to Illinois. Oh my gosh. It's just a whole lot of nothing and then a whole lot of nothing. That's right. And then a whole lot of, of course, it's going to snow. But anyway, um, never seen a teddy bear of a president. I don't know see the commercial bear suit. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, all right. So let's uh, look at this chapter nine. We're now going to get into, it's maybe the eighth module, but we're doing the chapter on race. This is always one of my absolute favorite chapters. So I've disappointed myself that maybe I made an announcement that sounded like people shouldn't show up today. I have no idea. Um, but I'm recording this. Uh, and so that way, if you didn't see it, uh, you can go ahead and, um, you know, and watch it or pass it on in this class. All right, let's get to some of these questions here. Um, da -da -da -da. Is racism, prejudice, and discrimination still a problem in the United States? We had 90 people answer. A was a major problem, B minor, C somewhat, and D, no problemo. Um, so major problem, 73 people. So overwhelming. It was like a landslide. Um, uh, minor problem nine, somewhat of a problem eight, and then zero for no problem. So is racism, prejudice, and discrimination still uh, a problem in the United States? Um, what do you think? Why, why did so many people say 
I mean, I mean, when it's 73 to the others, and we only had, you know, 90 people chime in, why is it a major, why do you feel like or believe it's a major problem? And yes, this is Soch, and yes, we're going to talk about race. A whole bunch, as a matter of fact. <laughs> what do you think? Why? Why so many people? I mean, I, this, is, this is unlike anything I've seen in the past. This many people, 73 out of 90 people, identifying it as a major problem. So usually we're pretty split, major, minor, somewhat. But, but right now, overwhelmingly. So why? I got all day to drink coffee. I get paid the same. What do you think? Nobody? We got 71 people here, and we had 73 out of 90 say it's a major problem, and we have no idea why. I don't believe that. You're tired, it's a Monday, the election's tomorrow, but I'm not phoning it in, so don't you either. What do you want? <clears throat> what do you say? I'm not gonna read these. Unmute your mics and participate. I'm feeling hardcore today. <laughs> I, think, um, I think maybe more people see it as a significant problem now versus like other years, just with it's harder to like ignore with um, the Black Lives Matter movement getting a lot more news coverage. And then you see how people who oppose it react so negatively towards it. So I think that's like a reason why it's more, like people are noticing it more because um, it's like much harder to ignore if you, even if you wanted to. <laughs> All right, good. Um, and maybe you bring up a piece that for, for a long, long time and continually, um, it's almost as if, if that, if that's not too big of an issue, then that'd be just great, you know, from a structural functionalist standpoint. But now you bring up a good point. Likely you cannot ignore it, right? Um, good. Uh, what else? Why else do we identify it as a major problem? Um, can you hear me? Um, I feel like now it's more like people who were discriminated against didn't feel like they had a voice. Whereas like now people are realizing that they can say something and there can be a change towards it compared to like in the past. All right. Good. Good. Um, all right. So I see one here, though. I will read this one, though, that says um, most recent large scale news coverage, Jacob Blake in Wisconsin. Yeah, that guy's in trouble in a lot of ways and hopefully spends his whole life in jail. Um, I won't pull any punches on that one. He's not even supposed to own that gun at 17. You can't cross state lines at that age with that weapon. And you can't show up to do what you're doing and be a terrorist there. So yeah, news coverage. And of course, then all of a sudden, two days later, this guy gets painted as a hero, which just never would have happened. Like up until this point in my life, that never would have happened, right? Um, or did not happen in the last 30 years that I can recall of something of that nature. So large scale news coverage. All right. What else? Why else do we think it's a major problem? Or do we know? Um, I think that especially this year, it's such a big thing because racism is um, like when people see Donald Trump, they do think of racism. Um, so I do think that especially since it's an election year, it's a lot more prevalent that people like have a voice. They can change something. They can do something about it. Okay, good. That's interesting. Um, it's an election year. Um, so, you know, people feel like we can do something about it. This is the time to make your voice heard. And of course, it's always right the time in a democracy to make your voice heard, um, to protest, to gather in, in hopefully largely peaceful ways. But yeah, election years. And certainly, um, I'd say it's, uh, you know, no, maybe it's an underestimation, but, but people do perceive the president as being very racist. Um, and we know that by having Stephen Miller, I mean, a card carrying white supremacist and Steve Bannon that you have employed, Stephen Miller still working as an advisor beyond me why that guy ever step, was able to step foot in the White House. But if he's not a white supremacist himself, the president is certainly surrounding himself with people who purport that agenda. 
So I think that my guess is that election year is combined with this. My guess is that we've just never seen the president of the United States be so forcefully, at least in your lifetime and in my lifetime, been so forcefully um, in support of white supremacy, racist platforms. And, and I would also say that by doing nothing, that contributes to that as well. So even if the president was just supposed to say, oh, that, that uh, Jacob kid or whatever is a nice guy, or oh, those are some very fine people on both sides, um, you know, by doing nothing, um, it speaks, I think, loudly towards the white supremacy um, tone as well. So maybe a bit of a cognitive dissonance. We're not used to having somebody in that position. And, and believe me, past presidents have been really racist. Ronald Reagan was high up there on the list when he was signing Martin Luther King Day into law. They said, how, how do you feel about this? And he said, well, we'll see. No, they, you know exactly how you feel about it. You do not want an African-American person uh, substance to have a holiday. And, and Reagan really didn't mince any words about that, but he also maybe wasn't as vocal or outward as we're seeing, as we're seeing maybe right now, but it's nothing new, systemic institutionalized racism and, and white supremacy, um, and certainly nothing new in our government. Um, major problem because people are realizing not just a person to person issue, but it's systemic. Uh, yep, people of color are being subordinated by systems in place, redlining, access to education. Good, I do think that people are more aware than ever before um, of how systemic uh, and just how much racism and discrimination is built into our, our systems, right? Um, what's one big institution that I think has been revealing that to everyone over the past year for a long time. But what, how can we say, what is, what, is one, what is one of these institutions that we can point to and say, yeah. The criminal justice system? Sure, yeah, how so? Um, well, I mean, most of the recent protests this year have like stemmed from uh, police violence against people of color? Yeah, law enforcement is a tremendous institution. And because uh, CRJ and sociology are, are closely related, I know we have a lot of CRJ students in these classes. That's not to say that the institution of policing is rotten from the up to the down and back and forth. What it does mean is that we can't, as human beings in a culture, say that it's off limits to suggest that the police could improve. Right. And that's kind of the resistance that I see. It's like, well, you know, there's a lot of pushback from law enforcement, which I expect, but law enforcement can and is willing to, in many cases, improve and be trained and have better training because that makes their lives safer. I mean, it seems ridiculous to me. Now, in the same tone, we know that the Fort Collins Police Department vehicles are still flying stickers on the back of every vehicle that have the blue life matter or the blue line flag. That is not uh, a historical flag. That flag came out uh, several years ago as a direct rebuttal or rebuke to the Black Lives Matter movement. And it's not the thin blue line that we think of for law enforcement. It's newer and it is pretty much a rejection of the efforts of Black Lives Matters. Now we know that there's a lot of fallacious reasoning that has to go into that because of course, blue lives choose that, right? Blue life being a police officer, that's a choice that's a job, that's training that you pay for, that is an achieved status. Now, when we talk here all semester long about um, ascribed and achieved statuses, we know that you are born into your race or the race that we perceive you at and your gender, the same thing. So Black Lives Matter is not a choice. Blue Lives Matter is very much a choice. And disappointing to me, I've reached out to Fort Collins law enforcement many times about this issue. And they simply refer back to the blue line, the thin blue line and historical premises, which is not sort of the meaning of that. I said, don't you think, and I've talked to the police chief, don't you think that your job would be easier if you didn't show up with a vehicle that quite simply says, or quite states quite openly that blue lives are worth more than, than black or brown lives or other lives. Um, so anyway, yeah, it is built into our institution, law enforcement, and of course our total, what we call the total institution, which would be the prison institution, how that functions. We know that the inequality there um, based around race is massive. And we'll look at that. When I say massive, 
we're going to look at you know statistical evidence that is important um, and, and and honest and and I think ways for us to address this. We already know that we're getting into this from the last chapter on stratification, where we looked at the wealth gaps. Okay, uh, any other reasons why we would choose that this is a major problem right now? Anybody else? I think this year more than any, we're seeing law enforcement actually as the instigators of violence in a lot of these protests. Um, and I think that stems directly from the, re the rhetoric of the president, um, but that's a whole nother bag of worms. But I think this year, certainly we're seeing more video, more evidence of yeah. um, law enforcement starting these, um, starting the violence, or at least certainly instigating it um, yeah. and escalating it. Yeah, heavily militarized. Right. So we've got military grade weapons over the last several decades into police hands and little training. Um, and so what we see happening is, um, yeah, mistakes that are costing people their lives are being made, but now they're being recorded. Now, that's been the way that it's been for a while. And police departments and communities have seen a really important data and, and a lot of important change since officers have been wearing cameras. Like it holds people accountable and it seems to be working for police departments and for the community. Um, and of course, not always in the final, like how this went down and what people really saw and all of that, but in the ability to capture that on film. So yeah, I do believe so. Um, I think that's a big deal. You look like you run a podcast from your house or something. You've got like the radio microphone coming down on the, you got, you run a radio show from your place or a podcast or something? No, I just had, I talk with a lot of different people about, uh, I'm really interested in space flight right now. So I wow. talk with a lot of different people in that community. Awesome. Uh, we watch like different the stuff together. I mean, no, I don't need it, but I got a good deal on it. So I figured why not? I like it. On it sale. Legit. I yeah, it that, like that too. It does look cool. <laughs> We're going to be taking calls today from social 102. How's it going everybody? All right. Um, yeah, we're going to drop in on the quarantine line. What's up? Okay, let's check here. Is racism, prejudice, and discrimination in the United States? And then we left it open. Improving, 44. Staying the same, 25. Getting worse, 19. So we've got about twice as many that's saying improving uh, in the midst of the fact that we also identify that it is a major problem. That's why I like Top Hat. Let's talk about this. Like, we identify that it's a major problem, and yet a majority of us almost times two feel that it's improving. This is interesting to all of us now, week 11 or whatever it is, a professional sociologist, make some observations. Why, I guess, why did you say what you said? Why did you say improving, staying the same, or getting worse? No matter what you voted. Um, so I said it was still a major problem, but improving, hold on, let me get my camera on. Yep. Um, all my coworkers were, we just drove to the next job site. So I have to track to myself now. You're all good. So I said both uh, that it was improving and that it was a major problem just because like, uh, I think I'm a big believer in that you can believe in, you know, or you can have two contradicting kind of, you know, it can be also a major problem, but also improving, especially like when you compared it to like, I don't know, like the, I looked back like the fifties and sixties, like the whole civil rights movement, how back then, you know, they were, um, African Americans were subject to like really horrible violence, which they still are. But I mean, a lot of it, like, you know, we had to desegregate schools and do all that stuff. Like it was really, really built in the culture, like some really major changes had to be made. Yep. Um, so I definitely think compared to then we've definitely improved. We've like desegregated schools and public spaces. We've gone a long way in improving, but also I think it's still a big problem. It's just improved and it's still improving, but it's, it's definitely like a slow process um, because I mean, I, this stuff is, was obviously like very, very deeply ingrained in our culture. And although we like improving on it, I don't know if things like that can go away overnight. Definitely. Cause like, I mean, kind of a unique perspective I have it I have on it is I'm from the South and not saying like generalized, like the entire South is racist. Like Geography they're great matters. people from the South. Yep. It does. I love, I love my people from the South, no hate or anything towards them. But I have a friend who like, they have family members who are pretty much just like openly racist. Like they say, yeah, I just don't like African-American people. 
So, and like, and that was obviously what they'd been taught and what their parents' parents had taught their parents. So it's like, it, it kind of reminds you that this stuff is still here. Like it's still really deeply ingrained in a lot of people. Good. And I, I can't remember if it was Chappelle or Chris Rock, but there was a, somebody who was talking years ago about, hey, like the difference between the North and the South is the racism in the South is out in the open. And the racism in the North and the West is more hidden and more institutionalized. You know, like people in the South are going to be like, mm, yep, yep, you too. And in, the, and in the North and West, we play different games. It's, it's, it's just different in the way that it's disseminated. So yeah, how we experience racism, really different compared to, you know, depending on where you grew up, right? Um, I mean, my experience in Colorado here to the last 20 years is much different than growing up in Illinois for 20 years. I mean, so very different in so many ways. All right. Uh, why else do you, did you say that it's getting better, getting worse, or staying the same? What do you think? I would say, at least as far as law enforcement goes, relationships have stayed the same um, overall. I mean, if you look back to the 1968 Chicago DNC riots and then look forward to the 1992 LA riots and then to the riots that we saw this year, I don't really see how the attitudes or behaviors of law enforcement officials have changed. I just don't. Yeah, yeah, the difference is, uh, one of the big differences from the 60s till now is, is just that they're working with high-grade military weaponry, you know? Yeah, if anything, they've gotten stronger and more brazen. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, um, you know, still using some of the same tactics. Uh, I mean, the president just said uh, several weeks back, uh, I'm going to keep you safe in the suburbs. We're not going to have any low-income housing here. And it's the same. I mean, it's not a dog whistle. Dog whistle would be something you can't hear. It's just bullhorn out in the open. Here's all the 20 ways that we've gotten like people to be racist over the past 200 years. Let's try every single one of them. And it really is something that I didn't think that I would have to revisit, but I have a lot of privilege. And my gender grants me privilege and my race grants me privilege. And this doesn't grant me privilege or my long hair, but I can cut that and put on a suit, and guess what? Oh yeah, I'm part of the club, right? So that's not the case for everybody though. So obviously, you know, how this impacts you um, depends on who you are, where you come from, what's your racial makeup, um, where did you grow up, all of these things. And that's what I think is really interesting because we're not just looking at it from a social perspective and saying, this president's awful or this person's racist or not. The reality is, like I said before, all the tactics that you're seeing right now used by people who are very racist, who, who thrive on discrimination, that's something that black and brown folks have already dealt with. It's not new. It's just being repackaged in different ways. And likely, if we're going to put it in perspective of the last hundred years, likely improving, right? I mean, on some ways, we think not. But across the board, I would say that the last four years of massive and then eight before that of much more overt racism and returning to these sort of notions and themes and cultural ideas have done nothing but sort of push people back. Because even though we know racism exists, you're now asking folks or people are asking folks to make a very overt decision. And most people are not comfortable being overtly racist towards other people, whether that's in their heart or not. So at least we are seeing um, what I would say is something that as sociologists we can con continue to look at and examine in meaningful ways. All right, let me look at, describe race relations in one word. All right, I'm just gonna roll down it. Divided got eight, tense got seven, complicated got five, unequal got three, and now we kind of start to get into the um, single stuff. Misunderstood, awful, complex, hateful, hostile, challenging, confusing. Judgmental, confused, slow, cautious, poor, apprehensive, terrible, deteriorating, dreadful, mediocre, unresolved, complicated, lost, disgusting, bad, frustrating, Trumpism, discriminating, intense, unsteady, rigid, problematic, changing, delicate, polarized, choppy, intensive, tension about power, segregate, strained, building, unstable, medium, broken, hated, stubborn, scrambled, improving slowly, chaotic, uneasy, hateful, long, crap. There we go. Let's just end that one. Ah, oh, crap. Um, with something. So yeah, I would say right now, um, I would say right now that we're in a unique place as we usually are. 
this semester, I would say that this is a very unique place compared to last year, four years ago, or 10 years ago, or 13 when I started teaching. So that's what we look at. And then I'll read this last one here. The fact so many minorities have had a larger voice through use of social media has been tremendous in the spread of information and support of the movement. Yeah, and, and equally scary are the um, organizations that have access to misinformation um, that, that cause a lot of people to believe things that, that, that just, that, that I can't even wrap my head around, right? But I'm a sociologist, so I'm gonna keep trying, okay? All right, let me pop over here and get the uh, chapter up here. I'm gonna do screen share, I'm gonna lecture for just a few. We'll talk about a few of these things. All right, and let's, there we go. All right, so uh, race and ethnicity. Uh, anybody know who's in the middle there? The two guys in the middle right underneath the title? Super famous when I, my dad's generation, but anybody? Who are, who are those guys? No. Somebody's got to know who these famous guys are. Anybody? The guy on the left? Sammy Davis Jr. of the Rat Pack. And on the right, Carol O'Connor, who was uh, Archie in Archie Bunker. A really, really, really interesting TV show when I was growing up that dealt really realistically with topics of race. Sanford and Son, the same things. There were so many shows when I was growing up that was like pre-Huxtable. <laughs> like pre Cosby show where things started to get a little less reality based and in terms of race relations, which I always um, found really interesting in the seventies and early eighties were able to talk about that uh, in ways that, that uh, past generation or, or previous generations, generations that followed after, excuse me, have not been able to. All right. Is our choice to cast a vote for a particular candidate uh, purely a personal decision? Um, as we look at some of the breakups, or some of the, excuse me, some of the ways that our votes are broken up, uh, American uh, men and women and politics. Uh, these are folks who voted uh, for Barack Obama in 2012. Obviously, they are related in ways. All right, who's on top? I'm going to give this another, this is another, these, are, these two are good ones. Who's the guy on top? Anybody? They're still interviewing him almost every single day. Who is he? All right, all right. You are gonna have to improve your game. <laughs> Social 100 students. That's Dr. Brother Cornell West, uh, Professor Emeritus at Harvard or Cambridge or something like that. But a, a guy who's been doing some amazing work his entire life for race relations. They are still reaching out to him. Um, how about the guy down below? Anybody, anybody, anybody? I'll give you a hint. He wrote A People's History of the United States, a much more accurate historical text about what was going on in this country. Anybody? Howard Zinn. The guy down below, Howard, look at him. Ah, oh, I love Howard. That guy right there, an amazing sociologist, just an amazing human being, just like Cornell West spent their whole lives. So we'll look at this next step. Does race matter to you? Yes, no. How much does race matter? Um, when I, uh, when I go around a classroom normally, it's interesting because what I do for this is does race, does your race matter? Or how does your race matter to you? And I'll walk around a classroom and this is where I invade your space and I pretty much like I have a microphone, just does your race, what does your race matter to you? You know, how does your race matter? What does it, does it matter to you? And what I find time and time and time again, and this is pretty standard, is that people who are in dominant culture will answer to that question, I don't know, not much. Um, and, and, and then the answers I get from people of color in the classroom are usually a bit more um, on target as, as far as like, I know what it means to me. And one of the reasons that we have to examine this is because if I ask, does race matter to you? And you're like, yeah, but not that much. Or how does race matter to you? And if I were to ask you that question, you didn't have an answer and you're a member of dominant culture, it's fairly typical. And what that means is not that you're an awful person by any stretch of the imagination. It means that in ways your race has not had to matter in significant ways or overt ways that you would, that you would see. 
So maybe you just kind of cruise through life so far. And yes, you have your challenges and your struggles. And so does everybody else. But when I ask this question of a person of color, um, nine times out of 10, those people have a solid answer. Um, and for those of us that might not, who are in dominant culture, um, that's something for us to be able to look at. Again, I started it with the last chapter, and I think I even said that at the very beginning of the semester, but we know that when we talk about race, and we do it all semester long, that we don't do so in a way that's like, has to do with guilt, right? Again, guilt is what you feel when you know you needed to take some action and perhaps you didn't. Responsibility is what you take right here and right now, right? So when we talk about all of this, it's, it's in a tone that it's important for us to talk about race regardless and not go to a place that has guilt in it because guilt gets caught up with anger and all of that stuff and it and, and doesn't get us anywhere, right? All right, um, describe what comes to mind. We'll look at a couple of these questions later. But basically here, um, uh, if people define situations as real, they are real in their consequences, okay? So right in the middle there, that's uh, some uh, epic fail by some of our CSU students last semester, I believe, in the spring. If you're to Google CSU racism or Colorado State University and racism, a lot comes up. Two Native American students that were on a tour a couple years ago or a year and a half ago uh, had a Karen who was in a mom of somebody that called in on them and they had to be pulled out of the tour to see if they were actually legitimately there, as if anybody in the world would want to go take a campus tour if they didn't have to. I mean, kind of like just for the fun of it. Nobody's that fun. Come on. All right, so, and it, and it goes back three years ago where somebody rolled up a toilet paper noose and put it outside a person of color's room. Come on, all of this behavior, I know people don't like to be called deplorable. There's no other word for it, you know? It's subhuman behavior that's dangerous and violent. It's terrorism, and it doesn't matter whether it's 50 years ago or 70 or 80 years ago, and it's go back to Africa or a colored waiting room only, or if it's 2020, the repercussions for people are the same if we dis define these situations as real, right? And we do. Race matters, and it matters because people predominantly in dominant culture have cemented over generations how much it matters and why. That is why we know that there's no accident to an eight to one wealth gap or an eight to, or a one to eight wealth gap or one to 12 uh, wealth gap. I mean, that's not, an act, that's not an accident. That's your institutions being set up this way and failing us or failing all of us because some of us that have privilege and others do not, that's not gonna work out well for us, right? We know that gender-wise, graduation rates amongst people who identify themselves as a gender female are continuing to increase, grade point averages increasing, people who identify as female are working harder and harder while people, and it doesn't mean that you're not working hard, who identifies the gender male have an expectation of some type of privilege and therefore are falling behind. Privilege is the invisible crutch that props you up and also is taking advantage of you at the same time, right? So let's ask these questions that we always have to ask. And, and you know, race and ethnicity, we always hear these terms separately. Are they the same? Are they not? We'll talk about that this chapter. Uh, what are race and ethnicity? How are they created by society? Why does the United States have so much racial ethnic diversity? And you would think, right, for a place with so much diversity that would we really be struggling with it at this point 200 plus years later? Why? why, why with so much diversity do we still continue to struggle? How are race and ethnicity important dimensions of social inequality? And look, a good question, who are disadvantaged and who are dominant, right? And we'll make those lists, we'll look at that and we understand some of this right now as we kind of get into it. Um, I have this question, but we'll get back into it. All right, there we go, look at that. I mean, that almost reminds me of my dog Boba, my Boston Terrier, the one right in the middle. I love Chewbacca. I love that Chewbacca right there. That's good. Steampunk Chewbacca. Uh, anyway, but what's race, right? I mean, I love Star Wars. You know, I love Star Wars. Is race like, is it like Jabba the Hutt? Is it some strange creature here from, I don't know, this is like a Thundercats thing? Is it, what, what is it? Like, is it people? Is it Wookiees? I mean, is it, is it aliens? How about Yoda, <laughs> right? Like, because for the longest time, I would have just assumed that we would be the human race, right? And if you're here on this planet, you got two eyes 
and two legs and, and fairly, you know, human being, um, or even just look, you're a human being. We know what a human being is, that that would be race. But of course, um, we understand that our understanding of race is more complex sort of than this, than just who is from our planet. Okay, uh, it's a big deal here, right? So it's a foundation of identity and it's a basis for social inequality, right? Race doesn't have to be and is not inherently a negative concept. Again, it's, it's a socially constructed thing. So who constructed it and why and how can we deconstruct and reconstruct it? So that's a really interesting piece here, right? Race, a socially constructed category of people who share biologically transmitted traits that members of the society consider important. That's the social piece right there, that members of a society consider important. So important that you have unearned advantages, so important that you have unearned disadvantages, right? It, it works many ways and not just two, both ways. So a foundation of identity, who are you, and a basis for social inequality. So socially defined group of people considered to be distinct in some ways and generally also considered by themselves to be distinct. Could be skin color, hair texture, facial features, um, if we're going to look at the small part of race, which happens to be connected to physiology and biology. Um, but, but for the most part, if I ask you the question, if you hear this question, is race more physical, right, biological, or is it more socially constructed? The answer every single time up and down, it is more socially constructed, okay? So, Let's get here uh, before I dip out, before we uh, end for the day. And it's got two components. Great test question. It's got a social component and a physical component. So group identity, group must be recognized in some way by its own members as a distinct group. That makes sense, right? Or at least having some characteristics in common. So social recognition. Without that, it will not be defined as race. And physical, every race is generally regarded as being somehow different in appearance from other races. Now, we're like halfway between this. Sorry, reformat it and cut this off. Um, but it's a social choice, right? To define what differences matter and how much they matter. That is inescapable, okay? So some of these ways that we've decided, some of these social choices we've made still impact people today, two to 300 years later. That is simply, folks, why race matters. Of course, we're gonna display racial characteristics based on where you're from in this world, right? Did you grow up near the equator? Were you Inuit or Eskimo tribes? Did you grow up in Norway or Sweden? And, and so there's not a lot of sunlight for quite a bit of the year. So the whole idea that we display racial characteristics really appeared among our ancestors as a result of living in different places, right? You have a variety of racial traits then because of migration all across the planet. So this is a real basic one, but we miss it, right? Melanin, pigment that gives you or gives your skin its color. It protects the skin from ultraviolet rays associated with very skin cancers. That's why folks that have darker skin, it can protect them from the harsh effects of the sun. Folks like me of Irish descent, freckled descent, ginger descent, need to put on sunscreen right now in my house before I walk outside because the sun's gonna get me through the window. That is not a lie, <laughs> right? Where were you and how did those changes in migration, how did they make a difference over time? Certainly changes throughout the year in non-equatorial populations. And if it's not the sun, you've got availability of food containing vitamin D. Of course, you're gonna get a lot of vitamin D from the sun if that's where you are at. A lot of people here might have a you know, a disorder that's that seasonal piece that you've got to get sun. Maybe you have a lamp in your room. Being in Colorado is probably a good idea versus the Midwest where you might get five months without very much sun. Um, regional cloud cover and the amount of clothing that you're wearing in response to where you live. So really, folks, um, there are so many people that want to purport biology. I mean, again, the president was just in Minnesota a couple of weeks ago talking about how Minnesotans have good genes. And he has talked, and you can find videos about racial superiority, his feelings on it, and how race horses have certain genetic characteristics and people are a lot like that. But we can't even agree on how many races there are. Maybe three, maybe 34. And of course, because they're socially defined, they change over time to time, place to place, and they're completely variable. So if we look at long-term interbreeding, 
people, right, procreating, that makes the notion of a pure race in the biological sense continuously more meaningless. And for all the folks out here that are coming from a biological point of view, knowing a person's racial category allows us to predict nothing about them. So although we put an emphasis socially on race, um, I would say that, uh, you know, you can predict nothing by it or with it or because of it, right? So, all right, um, let's, uh, we're going to stop there and I'll ask some more questions. I opened up some uh, top hat questions today. I might go back in there and see if I can find a few more. Otherwise, uh, we'll have class on Wednesday as usual. Um, and I will post this right after class. Um, is anybody have, does anybody have any questions? Yes, the Mandalorian. Yeah, that's right, got our first episode of season two. It was. That's what I was gonna ask. <laughs> uh, okay, let me answer a question here before I send this out. I wrote my uh, paper, two, two diabetes being housed caused by increased consumption of refined cut harbor of sugar influenced by 40 billion excess Just to be more specific. Um, yeah, adjust it by race because the numbers will be more tremendous when you look at that or socioeconomic status. Again, though, we know type two diabetes comes from eating poor foods, highly processed sugars. We know that that's some, usually folks in the lower socioeconomic status. So if you're picking a project or a project like, like for that last part for your two pages, here's a great rule of thumb. Is there a part to it that makes you go, hmm, right? Veganism, meh, too broad. Veganism amongst college students, eh. Veganism amongst people who wanna buy fake meat that is plant-based that tastes like burning flesh, whoa, <laughs> right? It doesn't have to be that much of a rabbit hole, but honestly, there's usually something about food or an aspect of this that is the interesting part to you. Type, type, two, type two diabetes, not as interesting to me sociologically, but maybe one specific factor and how that plays a role in somebody's life. Sure, or health um, or life expectancy. For sure. Um, speaking of life expectancy, I'm not really looking forward to flying into COVID land, COVIDia as I call it, which is Wisconsin and Northern Illinois. I already told you that, <clears throat> but I'm going to double mask up. I think uh, Julie just bought me some spray and uh, I think I'm just going to also uh, maybe wear a whole bo sleeping bag, might put a sleeping bag over my head, cut some eye holes in it. I don't know. Anyway, um, great. Uh, take uh care everybody oh uh that evil bird demon that was jabba's pet <laughs> oh yeah jabba's pet salicious crumb that's right um uh all right so no no more questions we're good okay the reason that i let you know that i'm going to be out of town i could ghost to this class and, and you probably wouldn't know uh after wednesday but people are reaching out and, and instead of being at my email i need to be there for my dad just plain and simple i, I even bought him a I bought him, I found a Verizon phone that went on sale that Cargit's not carrying for 20 bucks and it'll be his first smartphone. It'll be more than he'll ever need. And uh, I don't know, maybe he'll send me pictures of the dog, who knows, but I'm going to get him in on that uh, scene and help him this weekend. So thanks everybody for being fantastic human beings. Be good people and do good things. Yes, we have class on Wednesday. Uh, and remember, the next time you and I speak, we will we'll likely know who the next president of the United States is. We also know that that's gonna take maybe a little time to parse out, but do your part to go outside and breathe or inside. Take a breath because when you breathe, you relax and that allows you to process and retain more information. And look, going forward, no matter where you are or what you are or who you are as a person, we need to dial it down a little bit, okay? So I know that everything's kind of moving really slowly towards this apex. If you haven't, here, do yourself a favor. Go check out my band, Musketeer Gripweed. We just released a new single called Rich Man's Child. We're doing an Indiegogo fundraising thing that ends at midnight tonight. You don't, you don't need to give to it. You're my students. I'm not asking that. But if you want to go check out some positive music, you know, and you know what I say at all of my shows? Treat each other with more compassion, love, and kindness, even at the end of a rock and roll show. So I am pretty much have the same message wherever I go, whatever I do. So take care of each other. I'll see you on Wednesday. Should be an interesting day in this life. Peace, everybody. Take care. November 13th, Aggie Theater. November 13th, Aggie Theater. Buy yourself a safe, socially distanced table. <laughs>
<laughs> take care. I'll look buddy. into it. I'm going to try to get off work that night. All right. Uh, take care. <laughs>